Ah, well, welcome once again to the Waters and Stanton video channel. It's pretty damp out here. Dank, I think is the word, a bit foggy, a bit misty. But um, over the uh, last year, I've been messing about with vertical antennas and with horizontal antennas. And um, I've also uh, been experimenting with the uh, half square antenna, which uh, is up in my garden. Well, it's slight sag in the middle, but it's, it's working okay. And I have to say that the um, the spider pole that I've been using is uh, still uh, fairly straight. It's uh, stood up to some pretty uh, windy weather. I need to tidy things up a bit, but it's uh, it's still working okay. And I've got uh, the remains of a uh, 20 meter uh, vertical here, which uh, I've been using. But you know, one of the things that uh, always fascinates me is the performance or how do you assess the performance of an antenna well it's not easy actually and you can model it but the modeling doesn't really take into account the the garden size etc and what's surrounding it but uh, i've uh, come across recently a very interesting um, article on the internet which i'm going to put a link to below this uh, this video but uh, anyway let me come into slightly warmer atmosphere and uh, just talk you through what I've been uh, doing and uh, reading about recently. Well it's somewhat warmer in the studio here so uh... <laughs> Winter is approaching and I certainly feel it outside. This um, video really was sparked off by a friend of mine, Richard G3OQT. Now Richard G3OQT was licensed about the same time as me actually. And he was a great 160 meter operator. We were all 160 meter operators to start with, but he stuck it out. And uh, I think it was in 1960 or 1961, sh shortly after it had been licensed actually, he worked his first ZL on 160 meters. If I remember rightly, it was ZL3RB. I might, might have that wrong. But anyway, he worked his first ZL on 160 meters. Now, in those days, it was quite an achievement. Well, to be fair, it's even quite an achievement now. But uh, we had a 10 watt limit and... Um, you know, we all operated from typical suburban gardens, so we had to make the best of what we could do with. Well, Richard stuck it out on 160 metres for many years, and then he sort of disappeared off the scene. And he took up flying, um, and sort of 160 metres, oh, amateur radio took a back seat, and then about three years ago, he suddenly rekindled his interest, and he's now back on 160 metres, working all over the world from a fairly modest suburban garden and to work ZL on 160 meters now for him is just a matter of course he can work VK, ZL, he can work across the west coast of America, Honolulu etc etc. It's not quite straightforward of course you know you have to choose the right time when conditions are right you have to have the right antenna and optimize the antenna and that really is the key. Now Richard sent me a link to a website which is really very very interesting now the link that richard sent me took me to a very interesting document by jim brown k9yc who by all accounts has done an awful lot of operation on 160 meters from a small garden. The interesting thing about this document is that it contains an awful lot of information about vertical antennas. And this information, although specific to 160 meters, can be translated to higher bands. And uh, it's, it's a very full document. Now, let me just, uh, let me just make a few uh, generalizations, which I think we all understand. A vertical antenna is a very convenient antenna for many operators because it doesn't take up much space at all. The, the amount of acreage it takes up is very small. The downside is that you need to have ground plane of some sort, either radials, 
buried in the ground, lying on the ground, or if you've got room, ra tuned radials above the ground. And the radials of any vertical antenna play a particularly um, important part in the way it works. Now, one of the downsides of verticals, of course, is that it's low angle radiation. Now, why do I say it's a downside? Well, it's a downside if you try to operate on the lower bands and want to have a natter with your local mates, um, you know, two or three hundred miles away, because a vertical antenna lays down a fairly low angle signal. And if you're on 40 meters, for example, and you want to chat to your mate up in, I don't know, in the north of England, if you're in the south or in Scotland, um, you really need a bit of high angle radiation. So those that put verticals up in their garden and then try and operate on the lower bands are sometimes disappointed and it's even worse on 80 meters. The antennas are still working okay, but they're not producing the angle of radiation that you want. And also, of course, you want to make sure that your antenna is optimized and it's not actually as easy as you might think to optimize a vertical antenna. I've done one or two videos on verticals, but it's just not easy to actually optimize it because there are different trains of thought, but there are some generalizations we can make. For example, you do need some form of ground plane. Now that ground plane, as I said, can be above the ground, below the ground, or tuned radials spaced somewhat above the ground. Generally accepted that tuned radials produce the best results, but they're not the easiest to install in a lot of gardens. And the idea that you need quarter wavelength radials is actually not absolutely true. It turns out that it's the amount of radials you've got rather than the length of the radials. And in fact, it's much better to have a lot of shorter radials than a few longer radials. Interesting. Of course, this is covered in greater depth in the K9YC paper. Another interesting fact is that base loading is not the best. Now, I think many of us old timers will know jolly well that base loading a vertical antenna is by no means the best way of doing it. What is the best way of doing it? Well, the best way of doing it is to avoid base loading. If you base load an antenna, you're loading the part of the antenna that radiates because if you take a typical quarter wave antenna, and I'm talking about quarter waves at the moment, quarter wave antenna, the maximum radiation takes place at the point where there's maximum current. And that really applies to all antennas. It's the part where the current is maximum that produces the maximum radiation. So if you have a quarter wave vertical and you decide to coil the base up to shorten it, that's fine. It works. It's standard practice. I think we've all done it from time to time and there's a lot of commercial antennas that are base loaded but you're winding up the bit that radiates far better to move the coil up a bit higher in the antenna move it up halfway then you've exposed the part of the antenna that radiates it's, it's, it's a straight straight length without any twists and without any coils in it so you get more efficiency if you move your loading coil the antenna. The downside is that you have to have more turns on the loading coil as you raise it up the antenna. But the upside, of course, is that it becomes a more efficient antenna, which is why going back many years, center loaded whips were far more attractive for the base loaded whips. But in recent times, that seems to have blurred. It seems to have sort of disappeared off a lot of people's radar. Certainly, if you can um, install uh, an antenna with center loaded coil it's going to be much more efficient than a base loaded coil now this applies of course to mobile as well uh, mobile antennas try to go for center loaded if you can another technique which again seems to have disappeared a bit off the radar is the capacity loading we've all got limitations on the height we can erect an antenna in our garden and in a suburban garden, you know, we can't go perhaps above, I don't know, 30 feet or 10 meters, whatever it is. We've all got a limitation. Now, it's much better to avoid more inductive loading than you need to. And one way of reducing the inductance or the, the size of the loading coil is to add capacitive loading. 
Capacitive loading could be in the form of spokes, as we used to put on our uh, mobile antennas, or you can actually add wire to the top. In other words, you have a vertical antenna, you've got a center loaded coil, and you've got some wires coming from the top, like a wire capacity loading. That has the effect of reducing the amount of inductance you need to bring that antenna to resonance. There's also other uh, combinations because an inverted L is really a form of a capacity loaded vertical antenna. And you can also have a, have a T antenna. Now, all this and a lot more is covered in this document by uh, Jim Brown, K9YC. And at the end of this video, or rather not the end of this video, but below this video, I'm going to put a link to this document. Now, I must warn you, <laughs> this document contains an awful lot of information, but it's very, very well written. It's written in a style that most people will find easy to understand. It's not deep technical knowledge. It's, it's, t it's actually summarizing facts that you need to know when you're considering installing a vertical antenna. Now, as I said before, it was originally written for the 160 meter band. But so much of it is so true for any form of vertical antenna for any frequency. So I would encourage you to look at it. And as I said, there's an awful lot of information in it, but there's bits of bits here and there that you can sort of grab and think, gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So if you are thinking of putting a vertical antenna up, if you've got a vertical antenna, if you're thinking of operating on 160 meters or indeed any band using some form of vertical antenna, I encourage you to read this document. It's written, as I say, by Jim Brown, K9YC. And I think once you've read it, you will come out knowing an awful lot more about vertical antennas than you did before. Certainly much more than I could actually put into a video. So take a look at this document, enjoy it, learn from it, and put some of it into practice. There we are. So slightly different video this, uh, this time, but uh, I hope it's of interest to you and I hope it helps you. You take care, enjoy Ham Radio. Don't forget uh, down at Portsmouth, we've got a wide range of uh, products uh, available from stock. And if you want to do a deal, part exchange, whatever, just give us a ring. We'll be happy to chat to you and uh, do a deal. In the meantime, thank you for your support on this channel. It's much appreciated, doing very well on this channel. And uh, although it's a sort of a, a one man effort by me, um, it, uh, it seems to have uh, good support. So I appreciate your support there. Um, I also appreciate the comments. So there's some very interesting comments. And I think a lot of people actually learn from the comments, not, not only from the video, but they learn from the comments that people put below the video. So don't forget to read the comments below. In the meantime, enjoy your ham radio. You take care. And as usual, I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.